Ladies and gentlemen, good day and welcome to the Home First Finance Limited Q3 FY22 Earnings Conference Call. As a reminder, all participant lines will be in the listen-only mode and there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes. Should you need assistance during the conference call, please signal an operator by pressing star then zero on your touchstone phone. Please note that this conference is being recorded. I now hand the conference over to Mr. Manish Kayal, Investor Relation Head. Thank you and over to you, sir. Thank you, Fezan. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I hope that all of you and your families are safe and healthy. I am Manish Kayal and I head the Investor Relations for Home First. On behalf of the company, I extend a very warm welcome to all the participants on Home First Quarter 3 FI22 Financial Results Discussion Call. Today on the call, I am joined by Manoj Yushinathan, our CEO, and Nutan Gava Patwari, our CFO. I hope everybody had a chance to go through our investor deck and press release. We have also uploaded the Excel version of our fact sheet on our website and request you, you to have a look. With this, I hand over the call to Manoj. Uh, thank you, Manish. Good afternoon, everyone. If there's one phrase that all of us have been eager to use in the last 24 months, uh, it is BAU or business as usual. We are pleased to use this phrase with respect to our quarter three performance. Some of the highlights being highest ever disbursals of 570 crores. It's 11% higher than our quarter two disbursals, which was the previous highest. In December, we also saw the highest collection efficiency in the past 12 months, leading to a significant improvement in 1 plus and 30 DPD levels. The 1 DPD improved, from six, improved to 6.5% from 7.6% and uh, 30 DPD improved to 4.7% from 5.2%. Our gross uh, stage 3 stands at 2.6% um, and uh, the stage 3 is NPA of three, uh, 339 million, um, which is uh, actually uh, you know, not a 90 DPD, but it has been included due to the asset classification norms as per the RBI notification dated 12th November 21. Um, however, the said change does not have a material impact on the financial results for quarter 3. The comparable gross stage 3 figure as per the previous classification is 1.7 itself. Physical branches have gone up to 76 this quarter and total distribution points have gone up to 187. Uh, there is no incremental restructuring that we have done in quarter 3. Uh, immediately following this strong quarter, we saw the third wave hitting the country in January. We are still in the midst of it in some parts of the country while it is tapering off in some of the markets. However, now the number of new cases per day have gone below the weekly rolling average and 67% of the population has taken at least one dose of vaccination and 50% are fully vaccinated. Lockdowns have been restricted to weekends and night times. So all of this has actually helped in reducing the impact of Omicron wave and has ensured that the economy continues at an almost BAU level. At home first also, the impact of the Omicron wave has been minimal and the business momentum continues. We are pleased to announce that our AUM has crossed the 5,000 crore mark in January. We are grateful to our employees, customers, business partners, regulators and shareholders for placing their faith in us and encouraging us through our 12-year journey. In December, we entered into a strategic co-lending partnership with the Union Bank of India to offer home loans to customers at competitive interest rates. This partnership aims at leveraging the strengths of both entities to provide a seamless experience to retail home loan customers. We are pleased to report that the initial response to this program has been encouraging. Digital initiatives continue to see further progress. During quarter three, we have added biometric authentication in our customer app. Our customer app continues to enjoy high usage with 76% of our customers registered on the app compared to 72% in quarter two. Uh, payments and service requests made via the app in quarter three FI22 have gone up by 114% and 88% respectively on a year-on-year -year basis. 48-hour turnaround time for our loan appro approval improved to 90% from 88% in quarter to FI22. Our e-onboarding initiatives have been received well with e-stamp adoption uh, at 55% of loans, e-NAT in 50% of the loans and e-sign in 18% of the loans in quarter 3. I would also like to share that we have further strengthened our board of directors with the addition of one more independent director taking the total number of independent directors to four out of total of nine directors. Based on the recommendation of the Nomination Remuneration Committee, the board has approved the appointment of Ms. Sucharita Mukherjee as an independent director subject to shareholders' approval. Ms. Mukherjee's vast experience in financial inclusion and developing mass market financial solutions will hugely benefit home first. 
With this, I would li now like to hand over the call to Nutan to take you through the financials. Nutan, over to you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, all. I will take you through our performance in quarter three FY22. We continue to stay focused on our operating matrices with an intention to deliver mid-teen ROEs in a couple of years. Our NIM has expanded from 5.2% in quarter two to 5.7% in quarter three, coming mainly from sustained spreads and optimization of cash on the balance sheet. Net interest income has gone up by 36.4% on a YOY basis and 3.8% on a Q on Q basis. Operating expense has been stable this quarter. OPEX to assets stands at 2.8% for the quarter, flat on a QOQ basis. As guided earlier, we expect this ratio to remain around 3% to 3.2% going ahead as we focus on expansion. Cost to income was 33% in quarter three compared to quarter two of 35.2%. PPOP stands at 65 crores, growth of 9.2%. This is coming from expanding NIM base as well as continued focus on OPEX. Credit cost was range bound at 0.5%. Our ECL provision stands at 1.2% of the total principal outstanding. We continue to be conservative with the provisions. PCR stands at 46%. Prior to NPA reclassification as per RBI circular, PCR stands at 69% versus 77% in quarter two. Our reported PAT of 46 crore grew by 6.6% on a quarter on quarter basis. On liquidity and borrowings, our uh, long-term credit outlook was upgraded by ICRA from A plus to A, uh, A plus stable to A plus positive. The company continues to have diversified and cost-effective long-term financing sources. Total borrowings included debt securities are at 3024 crores as of December from 3075 crores as of September. We have a healthy borrowing mix with 45% of our borrowings from banks, 25% public sector and 20% private sector. 23% from NHB refinance and 25% from direct assignment. We continue to have zero borrowings through commercial paper. Our cost of borrowing increased by three basis points to 7.2%. Our Q3 cost of borrowing stood at 7.2% increased from 7.1% in Q2. Our marginal cost of borrowing for Q3 was 7.6%. Moving to capital, our total CRAR is at 59% and TR1 CRAR is at 57.8%. Our December 21 net worth stands at 1,510 crores vis-a-vis -vis 1,381 crores as of March 21. Our quarter ROA stood at 4% higher from 3.9% witnessed in quarter two. Our annualized ROE stands at 12.4%. Our book value per share is 172 as of December. With this, I open the floor for Q&A. Thank you very much. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on their touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. Reminder to the participants, anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one at this time. The first question is from the line of Karthik Chalappa from Bona Vista Fund Management. Please go ahead. Yeah, uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, hi, Manoj and Nukan. Congrats on a very strong quarter. Uh, I just have two questions. Uh, the first one is, uh, if we were to look at uh, the RBI classification per se, it is well appreciated that excluding that, the gross THC hasn't changed much. But I'm just curious why you have allowed the coverage ratio on stage three to actually dip, uh, which was around 29-30% uh, for the last few quarters has now gone below 23%. So what is the thought process behind not keeping the coverage ratio steady? Uh, so Karthik, uh, the current stage three that you're looking at is a combination of the prior stage three as well as the uh, uh, less than 90 DPD comp uh, in line with the RBI circular, which has been provided at 18%. So the composite number is at 23% and not the, uh, the uh, pre-RBI circular classification. That remains high. If you look at the uh, PCR as per the earlier method, it is about uh, close to 70%. Yeah. So basically, on the incremental NPA of the 339 million, you have just provided 18%. Blended looks at 23. Is it? That's right. That's right. 
Okay, got it, got it. Uh, and going forward, will there be any initiatives on our part to also convert the daily reporting of NPA to our regular NPA, or we will, we will just let that run its course? Uh, this is what we have done. So this 2.6 reflects the daily reporting of NPA. So this 2.6 uh, number that we are reporting now is as per the new guideline. Uh, we have just provided the uh, 1.7 number which is as per the earlier method of calculation. But going forward we are going to, uh, you know, we will have to uh, report the new number which is, two points, uh, which is in this case 2.6 percent for this quarter. Got it. The second question I have is if I look at the write-off for this quarter, uh, I think it's at about 80 million-ish or so. On an annualized basis, it works to about 60 to 70 basis points, whereas historically it was much lower. What led to the high write-offs this quarter and what? how should we think about write-offs on a more sustainable basis given that we are reaching a business-as-usual kind of a scenario? Uh, so, uh, Karthik, we are still, uh, you know, uh, you know, disposing of properties uh, there, you know, which were COVID impacted, um, and uh, we still have some, um, you know, cover on that. So, this quarter we have done probably 200 plus properties. Uh, so, you know, each property there is some residual, uh, you know, um, um, write-off impact, which is what we have uh, taken, and. Uh, um, I think we will have to be ready for maybe a couple of more quarters because uh, as we try and get that 1.7% number down, uh, it will basically involve uh, selling off of properties and, uh, you know, uh, squaring off the account. So uh, there will be some residual write-off in each case, which we will have to take. Excellent. My last question, which is more of a clarification, is if I look at our restructured book, uh, about 943 accounts have been uh, under the restructured book, which is basically the resolution plan framework 2.0, adding up to about 316 million. But that represents only 314 customers, which is basically three accounts per customer. Any reason why uh, we actually have three accounts per customer for restructure? Uh, yeah, Karthik. This is uh, so. See, historically, we have been. Uh, you know, there is an insurance. Uh, uh, which is provided for each uh, case, right? For um, you know, for the for covering the loan. Uh, so, as per normal industry practice, we also provide a loan for the uh, insurance premium. Uh, but from day one, we have actually been booking that as a separate loan. Uh, you know, that is uh, you know that was a recommended practice, and uh, uh, so we have been, when from the time we started, we decided to follow the recommendation, which is booking a separate loan for the insurance premium. So, practically every loan comes with an additional loan, which is the insurance loan. Uh, plus, all of these customers, uh, which we are talking about, restructured customers, are people who had uh, taken a moratorium last year in the uh, uh, first uh, during the first wave of COVID. So there again, we decided to provide these customers uh, rather than adding their principal to the original loan. Uh, you know, the customers' request at that point of time was that we would uh, like to treat this as a separate uh, separate loan and uh, pay it off at our own convenience. So we had again provided the moratorium as a separate account. So which is why there are three accounts for each of these customers. Oh, okay. Got it, got it. Okay, I'll come back in the queue for more questions, if any. Wish you and the team all the very best. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Rajesh Kothari from Alpha Accurate Advisors. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, congratulations for a good set of numbers. Uh, I'll just for two questions. So one is, uh, how do you see, uh, you know, the net interest margins from current level? Considering that you know our NIM has improved quite a bit in last uh, you know four six quarters, how do you see that from here? Um, so I think this year we have enjoyed uh, you know uh, you can say uh, good spreads uh, because the cost of borrowing has come down and uh, you know our correspondingly our yields have not come down and they have uh, held up. Um, so which is why our names have gone up. Um, I think going forward, I would say, I mean, uh, further improvement, uh, at least in the immediate future, will be uh, will will be difficult. But we would uh, try and sustain the uh, NIMS and uh, sustain the spreads that we have been uh, holding so far. Uh, there may be slight spread compression next year because you know we can see that rates are uh, tending to go up. Uh, so we are expecting maybe 20, 30 basis points of spread compression. But otherwise, uh, uh, we should be in a position to uh, you know uh, at a ballpark maintain the current NIMS and spreads. So when you say current means, see, 1Q was 4.9, 2Q was 5.2, and 3Q was 5.7. So when you say current means, uh, can you clarify? 
Yeah, so we have, uh, you know, maintained that, you know, we'll be, in, we'll be able to maintain spreads in the region of around 5%, so that uh, we should be comfortable to maintain going forward. Okay. Uh, my second question is, you know, if I look at from the competitive intensity perspective, uh, what is on ground, uh, you know, from, from where you are seeing the competition? Is it from the, you know, the new uh, fintechs kind of firm, which are into started, you know, the housing finance, uh, from which part you are getting uh, primarily competition from? Uh, competition is, uh, you know, uh, is, is, uh, there in uh, multiple fronts. Uh, so if you look at urban markets, uh, you know, these, uh, you know, we can say banks, commercial banks as well as small finance banks are, uh, you know, some of them are also uh, providing affordable housing loans. Uh, and if you go a little more, uh, you know, to smaller towns, etc., you have the, and, uh, uh, you know, affordable housing finance companies uh, which are competing over there. So it depends on the market. There are, uh, uh, you know, the, the competition varies. Um, so this level of competition has always been there in our uh, in our segment, and uh, uh, we don't see uh, it as a you know as a new phenomenon. I think uh, this level of competition in affordable housing is seen there. Okay, why I'm asking this question is basically from the yield perspective. Uh, you know, if I look at many of your competitors, they, you know, uh, of course, they on a blended basis they have a lower yield. So I'm just thinking from that perspective, that do you think uh, you know your yield can be at risk for the same quality of uh, underwriting? You know. Uh, see, see, historically we have always uh, competed in some of the larger markets. You know, where the competition has been intense, and uh, you know, we uh, since we were all we also have a. Uh, reasonable play in the apartment segment. Uh, that is a segment where you know there are larger players, banks, etc., also competing. Uh, so we are used to that level of competition. Uh, now, frankly speaking, as we go into smaller markets, um, as we as we are also doing, uh, you know, uh, more of self construction cases, etc. Uh, the uh, uh, you can say competitive intensity or the pricing pressure uh, is a little lesser than what we have faced in the past. I see. And uh, my one more question is, you know, from the you know digital perspective, uh, what kind of uh, what you've taken to improve the productivity, to improve the cost to income ratio, to improve the turnaround time? Uh, any major new additional steps which you would have taken in the last three, six, nine months? And also, uh, in terms of the your spend on such technology uh, from the platform perspective, what kind of spend you are doing that, and what kind of resources, if any, if you've added on the scene? Um, so we continue to invest on uh, technology, and for us, investment is largely in terms of uh, getting uh, you know te uh, technology specialists on board. Um, a lot of the technology that we use are not very expensive. Uh, it's more about adapting the right type of technology and uh, you know putting it to use. Um, so some of the things that we have introduced are basically uh, you know the uh, electronic or e-onboarding initiatives, uh, which is uh, electronic stamp paper. Um, and uh, the uh, e-NATCH process as well as electronic signatures, uh, e-signature process. So this helps in basically saving time for the customer because the customer can do these processes remotely uh, from his uh, or her residence. And uh, for us also it saves time and uh, you know uh, effort because uh, we don't have to spend that uh, level of um, um, time with the customer at the, at the branch. So it helps us to uh, access our process more customers. So that is, these are the initiatives that we have taken. Uh, and we have, uh, you know, as I mean, we mentioned the uh, penetration of these uh, uh, initiatives as well. So, for example, electronic signatures, we have had a penetration of about 18%. So, 18% of our customers have started using e-signatures, um, you know, and uh, that number is uh, likely to keep going up and uh, will obviously result in a lot of saving for us in terms of uh, manpower, time consumed, etc. Mm -hmm. Great, sir. Wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Shubhranshu Mishra from Systematics. Please go ahead. Hi, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, just a uh, couple of questions. So I just want to understand uh, what would be the average work experience of the salaried customer and uh, what is the onboarding for it? And uh, the second question I want to ask, which is slightly more qualitative, is that uh, what is the second line of management after you? So uh, how do we look at uh, uh, you know, the second line of management, uh, uh, if we can uh, speak on that slightly qualitatively? So two, two questions. 
Yeah, uh, so I actually didn't get, uh, get the first question. Can you just uh, repeat that? Uh, something on salary yeah. customers you mentioned. I didn't hear it clearly. So, and within the salary customers, what is the uh, average work experience onboarding for? For salary customers? And for, yeah. for them. Okay, okay. Uh, so salary customers, uh, you know, but see, uh, typically we onboard customers who are, uh, you know, 25 years plus. So the uh, experience, overall, uh, overall work experience generally tends to be at least three years, if not more. Um, our average age is in the region of around 35 to 37 years. So generally, generally, I would say on the book, the customers would have an average work experience of over 10, 12 years at least. Um, as far as the employer is concerned, uh, you know, we have a cutoff of 50 percent and uh, um, so generally the fire average uh, comes to around 40 percent or so uh, for most of our customers. Um, and uh, um, as far as the second line of management is concerned, after me, uh, we, have, uh, we have that in our, uh, you know, in the, in the tech also. Uh, so we have a management, com management team or management committee consisting of uh, 10 members. One is myself and there are nine other members. Um, so uh, that would be, uh, I would say, is the second line of, uh, you know, like a second line of management. And as you can see from the profiles uh, that we have uh, put up, uh, these are all uh, professionals from very, um, uh, very good backgrounds and very good uh, uh, industries and companies, uh, you know, and pedigree that uh, uh, that we have uh, we have uh, uh, taken the management team from. Um, so that the you can say second line, and even below the, you know, uh, management team. Um, we have a strong, uh, you can say, uh, 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 a strong line of uh, uh, people who are in the senior, who are in the senior leadership level uh, within the company, and we also have a program where we kind of groom them for, uh, you know, larger roles, etc. Uh, so uh, uh, I would say, you know, depth of uh, depth of management, depth of leadership in the company is uh, very strong. Sure, thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Sanket Shera from BNK Securities. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi, sir. Uh, Congress on good set of numbers. Uh, uh, my question was that we, in last one year, we have beautifully ramped up our ROA profile uh, from, from 1.7, 1.8, and now 4%. Uh, but now going ahead, how do we uh, see uh, this this uh, panning out uh, for maybe next couple of years? Uh, so any any thought process on that any uh, further levers that you see or uh, would, you would be happy to maintain it in the range of 3.5 to 4 percent yeah yeah so um, uh, so our way i mean see uh, it's it's a, it's a function of leverage also so as we leverage uh, you know the our way is probably uh, you know it will trend down but we are the, you know we have to look at a combination of leverage and our way um, so, uh, and we, as we had mentioned in the past, you know, the uh, the coming year, that is the FY23 and maybe part of 24, are going to be growth years for us. We are going to do a lot of investments. Um, so, from that perspective, our cost uh, costs are likely to go up a little bit. Um, and uh, but yeah, the, we should be in the ballpark of between three to three to four percent ROA. You know, as we leverage the uh, leverage further up. Okay, okay, sir. And so as far as uh, the previous question was concerned, maybe competition from fintechs and everything, uh, as far as I understand, maybe uh, uh, mortgage or higher ticket size uh, lending would be a large piece that a fintech would, would look right. Uh, maybe currently all the fintechs who have started some lending business, they're all operating between five to 10,000 average ticket size. So what's the what's the thought process on that? Unlikely to face any competition. At least mortgage as a piece, I believe would would uh, would unlikely to uh, would never face such competition from fintech players, a new age fintech. Yeah, players. yeah, yeah, yeah. So we are we are actually in we are actually you know in touch with a number of fintechs and you know frankly that is part of our uh, you know strategic alliance initiative. Uh, where we partner with fintechs and uh, you know uh, uh, online aggregators to um, uh, to acquire uh, customers. Uh, so I think one common thread is that is running across is that yes, it is it's uh, easier to do personal loans and uh, you know BNPL etc. through the uh, fintech model. Uh, you know where there is uh, probably just one level of check and a lot of that uh, a lot of that verification can be done online. Uh, in the case of property and you know specifically uh, housing loans etc. The um, uh, process is a little more elaborate. 
uh, and uh, customers have to also go through a lot of uh, decision making process at their end uh, and you know arrangement of initial down payment and so on and so forth uh, which adds to the complexity of the process so uh, practically all these players uh, you know uh, the fintechs or large aggregators have also been kind of going through this struggle or journey of uh, uh, converting customers uh, we are actually partnering with a number of them and uh, trying to assist in that journey and uh, trying to part, uh, trying to kind of build the journey together uh, it is going to be uh, you know it is going to be a, a slightly complex process and uh, uh, maybe a longer journey uh, but eventually uh, uh, you know through a through a collaborative process we intend to kind of uh, address this uh, conversion problem uh, and the fintechs will probably have to you know partner with companies like us to you know ensure that the customer gets a seamless experience because on their own uh, you know, and uh, they don't—they don't also have uh, large balance balance sheet size, uh, sizes and the um, um, you know asset liability match that is required, which is uh, you know for 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 a product like uh, uh, like housing loan. So it will be a partnership uh, or collaborative effort with the fintechs, uh, you know, and uh, but it it will happen uh, gradually. Right. So uh, in, in the absence of maybe uh, having a meaningful capital access at a cost that makes some business sense, uh, they are just likely to be enabled as, as, at least as far as your segment is concerned and not lenders. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, sir. Yeah. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Abhijit Tibrewal from Motilal Oswal. Please go ahead. Thanks for taking the question. Uh, I'm an old time. Hi. Good quarter. Uh, so two or three questions. Um, one thing is, I mean, during the quarter, have you received any some subsidies under the MAY scheme? No, this quarter we did not receive any subsidy. The second thing is, I mean, I, I remember uh, sometime last month we had given out a, a, a disclosure to the exchanges around the school ending partnership that you talked right. about with the union in India. The question is, does talk about um, uh, you retaining a minimum 20% of the loans and the remainder with uh, the bank. Uh, can you give some more uh, color around uh, what is the rate at which you will be kind of, um, let's say, giving these loans to Bank of India? So what are the effective yields or spreads that work out for you? Because at least my understanding is, compared to the direct lending, this core lending model should lead to better ROAs for you, right? Uh, so I think Abhijit uh, will break this into two parts. I think some of the you know uh, uh, transaction details uh, with the bank. So, and just the last thing on this, uh, Manoj, uh, will you gear the organization now towards uh, the strict daily stamping 90 DPD or do you think uh, you are comfortable with the current situation? No, no, we have already seen. We have, we yeah, yeah. So we see we were anyway a very uh, early bucket focused organization. As you can see from our one plus thirty plus number numbers, uh, you know our thirty plus is only four point seven percent, and one plus is six point five percent. So very we are very early bucket focused. That is, you know, basically collect from the customer as soon as possible so that he doesn't step into thirty days past due, etc. Uh, so this is in a way for us a step in the right direction. So you know it brings more focus on collecting from the customer before he hits the ninety day barrier. Uh, and that uh, those steps have already been taken on the ground. Uh, you know, people have been more sensitized now, more towards the 60, 89 uh, customers that we have to collect before they they, they hit the 90-day mark, etc. Uh, and uh, it's likely to be good for us in the long run. Got it. Got it. And this last question from my side is: uh, yeah, Can you share what would have been the LGD on the the recent uh, write-offs? Uh, on the recent, uh, uh, I mean, as in what we have like, so this quarter's right now. About 25 percent. Only 25 percent? Yeah, about, uh, about on an average, uh, that will be the number. Yeah. yeah. Oh, great. Thank you so much and all the best. Uh, thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Kunal Shah from ICICI Securities. Please go ahead. Hello. Hi, Kunal. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, hi, Manoj. Hi, Nutan. Uh, so, uh, sorry, again, touching upon uh, Sushmit's uh, question. So, when do we actually see the 
convergence of uh, maybe the currently recognized uh, norms to uh, the early stage 3 which used to be kept uh, uh, below 1.7 1.8 or percent so how much time is it going to uh, take okay once uh, we gear up the entire organization towards uh, uh, this kind of a collection and the daily stamping uh, uh, mechanism Actually, Kula, it is difficult to. It's a little early, early days. Uh, we'll have to see how the flows are, uh, you know, how the flows are moving for, uh, you know, couple of months to uh, make a predict, make a more pro proper prediction. Uh, plus, we also require, you know, a, a decent period of no, you know, no COVID and you know, a sustained, uh, sustained collections or good collection period uh, to kind of predict better. Um, so I think uh, maybe in a couple of months we'll be able to give a better number, better idea of you know how that uh, how that uh, trajectory will move. Okay, and uh, given this kind of a scenario, maybe in the uh, in the normal circumstances, should we then ideally see uh, our 30 plus uh, DPD, okay, which uh, on an average uh, uh, say would would have been less than two odd percent and very low, maybe less than one odd percent as well in March 18, 19, 20. Uh, do we see it uh, uh, somehow getting towards that uh, uh, number broadly, maybe at least in terms of the uh, stage two, excluding the stage three? Uh, so uh, the, the, would it really help in terms of focusing on such a early bucket will get the numbers down structurally? Yes, internally we are, uh, you know, we are very focused on that. Our idea is that, you know, our one plus and 30 plus should, uh, should, should go down. Um, it's uh, and as you can see, you know, one quarter of good collections, or even one month, actually, December being a great, a great month for collections, uh, uh, resulted in a good uh, significant decrease in one plus and thirty plus. So I think all we need is a sustained period of, uh, you know, uh, you can say normalcy, you know, without any uh, COVID wave or any disruptions due to lockdowns, etc., which will uh, basically help us to then bring our numbers, uh, you know, back to pre-COVID levels. Um, and uh, in this segment, uh, you know, anyway, that is what is required because once a customer slips into 30 plus, uh, you know, then he, the customer also struggles to make more than one payment. Uh, then he continuously gets stuck in that bucket and, uh, you know, it becomes challenging for the customer as well. So uh, it's better to encourage the customer, uh, uh, you know, in the early bucket to, you know, pay, make one payment and stay out of delinquency, which has been our focus and we continue to remain focused on that. Sure. And this entire uh, uh, 34 odd crores that would be purely because of daily stamping or there would be some accounts wherein maybe because of the upgrades uh, uh, not allowed till they clear the entire overdue, uh, there could be some uh, sticky uh, buckets okay, or uh, customers in some sticky buckets uh, who are now getting recognized. Or this is purely daily stamping that maybe if I, we would have recognized it on a December end number, then this 34 crores wouldn't have been there. How would it be the split between the two upgradations and uh, uh, maybe the daily stamping? Correct. So which is why we've given both the numbers. So if, if you ask, this is purely on because of the upgradation issue, right? Because if, as per the earlier method, if we were to look at it, it is 1.7 only. No, no. I'm saying in uh, maybe apart from the daily stamping, okay, somewhere uh, there would be some customers who would always be sticky in, uh, say, uh, uh, in, in say 31 to 60 or 61 to 90 day bucket. Okay, so mm -hmm. is there any recognition which was done for those accounts as well, or this is purely a daily stamping one? No, no, this is entirely daily stamping. Uh, okay. But uh, but sorry, Kunal, I've not I think understood your question too, uh, too, uh, too well. Uh, at the stage two, is there a sticky bucket in that, or is it just a full rollback issue? It will be a mix, actually. So this would be entirely because uh, without the reclassification is 1.7 no? because that means all those customers would have paid at least yeah. one installment in that month. Yeah. Uh, so oh. yeah, that 90 day basis points, all those customers would have ideally paid installment during the month, so which is why they have, you know, as per old method, we are still at 1.7. Sure. And one last question in terms of uh, balance transfer out. So gradually it's moving up, it's now 5 odd percent. Uh, should we consider it to be more business as uh, maybe it's a normal course and we would not be too worried or maybe it's been inching up all through over last four or five quarters and uh, we would be taking uh, uh, maybe the measures in order to reduce this uh, BT out from 5% currently? Mm, no, I think it's range bond. I would not put it, uh, you know, I would not get alarmed by it. I mean, it's generally in the 3 to 5% range, not, you know, uh, 
I would say I have yeah. not. Uh, yeah, so three to five, it's now getting towards the higher end of the range. Okay, and uh, that's the reason maybe any any anything which we are maybe any any uh, initiatives or uh, measures which we are taking to ensure that okay now it doesn't cross uh, five or percent the way uh, the gradual trajectory has been upward all through over last three quarters. Yeah. Uh, the, there are you know usual initial usual engagement processes that we have with customers etc which we are uh, which we are doing and uh, we are confident that we'll be able to stay in that range okay okay so uh, the only uh, maybe the context was uh, would we ever look at maybe lowering the rate in order to maybe manage this at a lower level now uh, would that be uh, one of the requirements or not uh, at this point in time no, no kunal actually we have done that analysis and uh, you know frankly speaking the balance transfer rate at lower rates is higher you know so if you look if you plot the balance transfer rate uh, you know right from let's say 9% uh, uh, customer rate uh, interest rate to 14% it generally tends to be higher in the 9 to 10% or less than 9% range uh, so the lesser the customer is paid up front, uh, you know, he's more sensitive to the rate. So that, I mean, so reducing the rate by, you know, 20, 30, 50 basis points does, does, doesn't generally help. Okay. Okay. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Nidesh Chain from Investec. Please go ahead. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, can you speak about the expansion uh, <clears throat> in branches and employees that uh, we are talking about? and which will lead to our OPEX ratio increasing to 3.2%. Uh, uh, can you speak about that? Uh, what is the number of branches and which locations we are adding and what is the quantum of uh, number of employees that will be adding and time frame as well? Uh, yeah, so we had uh, we had prepared a plan for the, uh, for the next three years and we are in the process of rolling that out and uh, you know implementing that plan on the ground. Uh, it basically involves a deeper uh, presence and uh, distribution in our uh, six chosen states, which is uh, Gujarat, Maharashtra, Tamil Nadu, Karnataka, Andhra, and Telangana. Uh, we are uh, looking at, you know, over the next two years, we are looking at doubling our, uh, you know, uh, sales workforce on the ground. Uh, so that plan is again underway in you know, the whole hiring, training, etc. Uh, we have we have identified a set of um, um, clo close to 350 towns where we want to be present in the next uh, by by FI24. Uh, so out of which uh, we have uh, you know already covered about 180 of them, and there is another 180 to be covered. Uh, so if we have a quarterly plan for those uh, you know for the rollout of uh, distribution in these uh, you know remaining 180 towns. So all of that is underway. Uh, so every quarter, as you can see, the number of towns that we are present in the distribution points are getting added. Uh, and that is all basically the implementation of our, uh, you know, you can say distribution strategy for the next three years. And uh, in that context, our ROE target of mid-teens uh, will get uh, pushed uh, to some couple of years or it will remain there that for over next two years we expect to reach uh, mid-teens ROE? Uh, yeah, the target is to get to, uh, you know, mid-teens in the next couple of years. It are a bit confidential. Um, but broadly speaking, you know, the idea is to offer the offer the loans at a you know competitive rate to customers. So, uh, you know, typically if our rates to uh, you know affordable housing in the affordable housing segment are in the region of between 11 to 13 uh, percent, the idea is to offer these loans at uh, you know at much lower levels, you know, closer to the prime uh, rates that are uh, prevalent in the market. Uh, the exact uh, you know information is something that I, that is a confidential between us and the partner bank. Um, and so the, so, so the idea is to, you know, you can say address, uh, address a different segment, a segment which is, uh, you know, more formal and probably uh, you're looking at, you know, slightly uh, higher size or higher ticket size properties. Uh, but of course, subject to the priority sector uh, definitions, uh, you know, which are applicable to this co-lending uh, co program. So that is really the uh, objective uh, behind, uh, uh, behind this. Uh, yes, uh, to 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 say, I mean, to, to talk about the ROA, etc. Yes, this is definitely an ROE accretive uh, accretive program uh, because uh, uh, you know the 20% that we are keeping on our books will obviously be uh, you know uh, I mean the way the uh, co-lending program is structured uh, or uh, recommended by RBI, it will be running at a higher rate, uh, whereas the part that is with the partner bank will be at a lower rate, and uh, there is a blended rate that is offered to the customer. Um, and uh, as per the as per the terms that we have now with our partner bank uh, that we have signed up with, yes, it will be it is an ROE accretive model. Okay. Well, if I understood you right, I mean this 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 partnership should be both fee income as well as NII accretive, right? Your your net interest income should also 
I mean, benefit from this co-lending partnership. Because, like you said, uh, the lender date at which you are offering it to the customer, why you yeah. will be kind of parting it with the bank at a lower rate. That's right. Thank you. The other question that I have is um, uh, on this uh, liquidity rationalization that we have now started and we, that we can see. Uh, is it also kind of feeding into the news that we have kind of reported during the quarter? In terms of the negative carry coming down and to that extent uh, benefiting you on the news? Abhijit, can you repeat your question? Yeah, so, so I think, I mean, we've already started uh, the journey towards uh, rationalization of the excess liquidity on your balance sheet. Right. So, so is that also feeding into, I mean, I mean, the kind of means that we are seeing now? Definitely. Uh, so uh, at a spread of 5.6%, uh, uh, our means, uh, uh, so same spread for last quarter, our name has gone up from 5.2 to 5.7%. Uh, large part of that contribution is uh, from uh, the cash optimization and of course from the growth also uh, coming from leverage. Uh, so those two are the contributors, but a large contributor is also the cash optimization. And, and lastly, if I, I mean, if I might ask, uh, I, I'm sorry, I joined in a little late, so I mean, might might sound like a repetition. Uh, but but we've taken write-offs of I think about eight crores during the quarter, right? Yes. And earlier in the year, you had already taken write-offs of another twelve crores. That was in quarter one. Yeah. So, Abhijit, so in quarter one, we had taken the one-time uh, write-off because there were some sticky accounts which we had mentioned, right, in uh, the uh, NCR region. So, we had taken taken that as a one-time. Uh, this time, it's more of a BAU because we are, uh, as I mentioned, we are disposing of a lot of properties to, uh, you know, square off the COVID uh, impact. Uh, so, as a result of each property, there is some loss that we are incurring and uh, which is the uh, reason for the write-offs. Okay. I mean, what, what I was trying to understand here is, I mean, let's say if you take in light offs of 8 crores during the quarter, I think it would be fair to assume that, I mean, it would have been at least 50% provided before we choose to write it off. So, I mean, I mean, if I just do this math that we have reported a gross stage 3 of 102 crores after including those 339 million of uh, assets which were classified in the stage 3 because of RBI, even if I remove that, that works out to about 68 crores. And then if I were to do, maybe just add, let's say, 16 crores, because, and, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong, I'm just doing a simple math that if you've taken write-offs of 8 crores, assuming, I mean, those loans were worth something like six, 16 crores. So what that means is, I mean, they have... Abhijit, let, 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 let me do the math for you. So the loans were worth 8 crores. And the PNL impact is two crores. Uh, so you're right. If you remove uh, 102 uh, crores of uh, NPA, you remove the 34, you get a 68. So that is essentially uh, what we have from a 1.7 percent equivalent number. And yeah, yeah. The application number is the 68 crores. Basically, that's uh, that's the correct number. The write off of uh, the loan has been 8 crores, uh, which is the principal outstanding value, and the impact of that on the PNL is only 2 crores because we were already carrying the provisions. Got it, got it. Thank you so much. I'll wish you the very best. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Sushmit Patoria from Motila Loswal. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, uh, Vishin, you're very happy to be here and uh, congratulations on the results. Uh, my first question is, uh, if you could uh, you know, tell us when do you think the check bounce rate uh, comes back to your old uh, levels of 10, 12 percent, or you think this is the new normal? No, it should come down. Um, I think uh, we are just also dealing with uh, some new, uh, new, new phenomenon as far as the check bounce is concerned, which is a lot of customers now have multiple accounts and uh, uh, some of them prefer to uh, pay pay through you know uh, online methods post uh, you know post the date uh, post uh, post the date of electronic debit. Uh, so that is something that we are uh, that's a new phenomenon that is now taking place, and we have to I, I think you know address that address that separately to also bring down the uh, bounce rate. Um, but yes, we are uh, we are working on it, and uh, it, it is some it is something that is there on our radar. It will it will come down. So, uh, Manal, actually on this, I was wondering if uh, you have explored uh, open 
and uh, you know if you can uh, push your customers to go on open with the banks with the respective bank that they have uh, i understand that sbi is very strong have you thought about this whether you would go on open have you done any hackathon any api testing uh yeah so we, we, uh, we will eventually go on okay uh, it will help us to understand the customer profiles better understand uh, uh you know understand i mean at least some of the digital uh, digital imprints that they are leaving we will be able to pick up etc uh but it's still very early days even the account aggregator network is not fully settled uh and uh, you know uh, it's still work in progress so uh, i think it will take some time for the okay network to uh, you know kind of start 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 giving results right okay and uh, the second question manoj is uh, with this whole daily stamp is still a little confusing for us because uh, please correct me if i'm wrong gs2 doesn't have daily stamping correct so it's only the npa recognition which is got daily stamping yeah so uh, yeah so let me maybe ex- explain what the daily stamping is all about it is uh, the, the basically the rule is that uh, the new rule is that once a customer crosses into 90 days past you see our reporting date is generally the end of the month right so uh, and typically the the presentation or the check uh, you know the check clearance date is up uh, is on a particular day in the month so let us say fourth uh, for your concern so on fourth of the month if the customer let's say bounces his uh, fourth payment he basically steps into steps into the 90 plus territory right because he has crossed 90 days from his from his earliest payment so uh, uh, we still had another 26 days to collect the payment from this customer uh, and the customer would have then come back into the less than 90 day category which when we when we were reporting the numbers at the end of the month but with daily reporting what happens is that on the fourth of the month the, the customer is already crossed into 90 day pass due so we have to con- uh, continue to continue to keep him at 90 day pass due even if he pays one more payment and comes below 90 day pass due so that is the rule so now as of the end of the month even if we have managed to collect one payment from the customer uh we will still have to record him as a npa or a potential npa so which is the uh, increase uh, increase that you are seeing so about 90 basis points those are the customers who would have normally paid on installment and stayed out of being in npa but now you know as per the new rules we have to also classify them as npa correct okay. so the, the only thing from a analyst point of view and somebody who is sitting outside is then the relevance of gs2 uh will not be that uh important anymore because the measurement of gs2 is different from the measurement of gs3 now yeah it is it is different but yes to that extent the gs2 is obviously a much much higher quality than a gs3 i mean a gs3 uh or rather we can say gs3 you, you have to look at gs3 split into two parts uh, so who is a chronic customer who is continuously continuously in uh, gs3 and uh, not be available to us right yeah, who is kind of borderline i mean yeah i mean uh, yeah. yeah right now the data is not there but uh, you know uh, that's something which we can which we can look at to analyze the analyze that bucket sure sure understood thank you sir thank you the next question is from the line of chandrashekar shridhar from fidelity international please go ahead hi thank you i have a few questions uh, one is um, uh, you have said that uh, i think at the end of the first or the second quarter is that if you are uh, bau so that you typically focus on reducing your uh, npls by about 10 bits per month so that the exit uh, under the old norms would be about one uh, you know 1% by by march uh, we are at 170 under the old norms uh, there really reasons why we are still not um, uh, there uh, just from uh, from a target perspective then just related to this you did say that uh, the lgd on the apartments was uh, so what you so what you wrote off was 25% i i thought you did say that you sold about 200 apartments in your wrote off 8 crores uh, seems like uh, the lgd was 40% so just trying to understand uh, that uh, uh, third was uh, where just we in conversations on a rating upgrade uh, and uh, you know given where uh, our cost of borrowing is will that result in any meaningful change in the cost of funds uh and this the last one is uh, you know given where our yields are currently um, can we do we have the ability to price up keeping a similar business mix uh to keep spreads at these levels or um, you know if if cost of funds go up that uh, you know there will be maybe a slight downshift in spreads thank you 
Sure. Okay. See, on the uh, on the uh, on the NPA side, I think I will uh, you know probably uh, first talk about the um, uh, one plus and thirty plus metrics, which have significantly improved. So we have actually focused on uh, uh, improving our uh, early delinquency because eventually that is what will be. I mean, the flows uh, you know flows will come from there. The NPA flows will come from there. Uh, so there is this quarter there has been a lot of focus on bringing that down, and uh, I think that. Uh, improvement, which we are, uh, you know, so there is more than a one percent improvement in uh, one plus, for example. So all th that improvement will flow through. Uh, plus the, uh, uh, you know, uh, talking about the ten basis points or the reduction back to, you know, pre-COVID levels, uh, it will require, a, you know, a stretch of period where, you know, there is no disruption. So uh, unfortunately, again, we have had a wave, uh, COVID wave three, and we will have to see how that plays out. Uh, so, you know, a stretch of, you know, uh, six to nine months or 12 months is required to, you know, get uh, get things back to a pre-COVID level. So, uh, we are hoping that now, uh, going forward, we will, uh, hopefully this year, we will have that, uh, you let's say, continuous uh, stretch. Um, coming to the uh, NPAs and write-offs, uh, so, uh, yes, if you take it as a, you know, if you take it as a clear, I mean, as a straight percentage, uh, you are right, there is a, you know, it will it works out to some uh, 40%. Uh, but this largely, uh, you know, uh, uh, what Nothan was mentioning is that out of the 200 properties that we have sold, uh, predominantly the properties have been sold at 20, 30, 20 to 25% uh, kind of an LGD. And there are there are few properties, uh, you know, where we have, uh, let's say, uh, you know, poor chances of recovery, etc., where we have uh, uh, taken, a, uh, taken a larger write-off or return it off. So I think as a combination, you are seeing a, uh, seeing a larger number. Uh, but predominantly, I mean, the 200 properties that we have... Um, uh, we have sold. Uh, we are in the region in the ballpark of around 20-25% uh, LGD. I think your third question was on the uh, pricing, our ability to price, the pricing power and the uh, and the commentary on cost of borrowing. Uh, so let me take the pricing power first. Uh, so uh, see, we have historically competed in very competitive markets, larger towns, in the apartment segment, etc. Uh, and we have developed uh, uh, competitive advantages uh, in that segment, which allow us to, uh, you know, uh, uh, still still get us customers. Uh, uh, now, uh, today the, at the juncture we are at, we have uh, uh, the uh, uh, the distribution that we are planning is in um, uh, urban peripheries, smaller towns, etc., where the ability to price the uh, price is much better. Uh, so, uh, the 180 towns that we are now planning to go into are. Uh, you can say it uh, on a rel relatively less uh, less, uh, less competed or competitive towns, and uh, hence our ability to price is better. Similarly, our we have so far our uh, you know exposure to LAP etc has been fairly low. Uh, that's another area where there is a headroom for uh, pricing. So we are still at about 10% penetration on LAP and uh, you know high yielding products. So there again there is some headroom uh, where we are ability to price. So the pricing. Uh, our ability to price will be uh, will be strong going uh, you know for the next couple of years uh, you know as we go into smaller markets and uh, do a bit more of lap etc. On the cost of borrowing side, yes, we have enjoyed very um, very good cost of borrowing this year, uh, and some of that is likely to you know I mean the the cost is likely to tighten over the next maybe few quarters, and some of that uh, some of those gains maybe uh, may may go down. Uh, but we'll have to wait and see. As of now, it's uh, still early, and uh, you know, uh, last quarter we have only—I mean, the cost of borrowing has increased only by 10 basis points. So you're saying that I mean, the cost of borrowing goes up uh, is a possibility. The cost of while cost of borrowing goes up, you're some you can maintain this level of pricing, but you can't sort of you uh, you uh, you may not be able to uh, up yield beyond a certain point, which is why maybe there could be from where spreads are right now. Uh, there may be a 50 per 50 bits down tick over maybe the next couple of years. Uh, yeah, that's right. So if we are going, if you're going to see a you know continuous uh, let's say period of cost of borrowing increase of let's say 40 50 basis points, yes, we may be able to claw back some of that, but not entirely. Sure. Can this be alleviated by if you want to get a rating upgrade then on the impact on cost of funds? Uh, so Chandra, as you would have seen uh, with Ikra, our rating outlook has got upgraded. Uh, so I would give it a time period of 6 to 12 months, uh, assuming that uh, we continue to perform uh, on all parameters. Uh, so the conversations are going in the right direction. Um, so I think that's the time frame we are putting, 6 to 12 months. Uh, but sorry, just to, does this result in uh, cost of funds dropping here on? I mean, uh, relative to where you are. 
marginally, uh, it opens up more opportunities uh, from a liquidity standpoint, let's say the uh, insurance companies and uh, a deeper bond market. Uh, so those are the bigger benefits. Uh, if I look at from an ALM perspective, a seven-year uh, 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 the pricing will change meaningfully, may not be maybe 10, 20 basis points, but not very meaningfully. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Shripal Doshi from Equarius. Please go ahead. Hello, sir. Uh, congratulations to you and your team for the good set of numbers. So my question was with respect to uh, what would be the incremental yield in the housing and in the lab segment currently for the quarter, and what was it during 2Q, FY22, and 3Q, FY21? And the second part of the question is that uh, we've seen lab, uh, sh share of lab inching up marginally. So would it be a thought process uh, that we would take the share higher of the lab uh, to support NIMS going ahead? Uh, yields uh, are in the region of 12, uh, 13%, 13.1%, uh, 13 I think is the incremental, uh, um, you know, incremental yield for quarter three. Um, and uh, uh, I think, uh, uh, sorry, was there a question uh, related to that? Uh, so, so is that is that for the housing and, and what would be for the lab? Uh, so lab yields are generally in the region of uh, 14 and a half percent, 14 and a half to 15 percent, and housing yield, uh, you know, typically between say 12 to 13 percent. Um, and uh, 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 since about 10 percent of the 8 percent actually of the AUM is lab, um, I would say uh, housing yield would have been about 12.7. Yeah, 12.8 um, percent. Yeah, so the housing yield for the last quarter was 12.8, and uh, lap yield, uh, uh, as I mentioned, 14 and a half to 15 percent. Uh, so, giving the overall blended yield of about 13.1 percent. Uh, so, we have always guided that you know there will be some creeping, uh, creep, creeping up of lap because as we increase distribution points and uh, you know we uh, we have a more mature presence in our existing markets, uh, there is uh, there is a lot of demand for lap product and. Uh, you know, uh, you know, as we also understand the markets better, we uh, don't say no to customers. So uh, it's likely to in inch up, uh, and uh, but not you know, it's, we are not looking at some dramatic change, change or increase in lab. It's likely to inch up, and uh, we are comfortable up to a 15% or 20% kind of a number, uh, you know, on an overall basis, which will probably take a few years. Uh, so you know, as you can see, it's probably inching up by 1% every quarter. Um, so to get from the current 8% to even 15% will probably take us eight quarters. Got it. And so, what would be the uh, like? If you can give some uh, color on the lap loan uh, book, as in, if do we track the end use? Would it be more for the business purpose, or would it be more for the personal use of the people? It it, it's, it actually falls in three buckets. The lap loans that we do, um, a, a large part of it actually about forty percent of it is customers who have recently uh, built a house. Um, and uh, when they were building the house, they decided to borrow from friends, relatives, etc. And then uh, once they have completed the house, uh, they realize that, you know, some of that money has to be returned and then they take a loan against the property to, uh, you know, re refund or uh, reimburse their relatives, etc. So that is a big chunk of the lab that we do. It's really, uh, you know, housing finance uh, which uh, comes, at, uh, comes at a lag uh, uh, and it's just classified as lab. Um, the other two buckets are, uh, you know, consumption and business. Uh, so about 30 percent of the 30 percent of the lab business is for uh, business use. Uh, so uh, businessmen who want to, uh, you know, increase their inventory and things like that. Uh, and another 30 percent is consumption. So medical expenses, educational expenses, uh, marriage expenses, etc. Things like that. Got it. And so there was a discussion with respect to co-lending. Uh, so what is the stat What is the thought process? Uh, like what? To what percentage of our AUM would we want to limit that uh, channel of business in our overall AUM? Uh, so it's again, uh, you know, we have to see how this pans out. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe I'll start with the objective of this uh, whole program. The objective of this program is to leverage our existing distribution. Uh, we, uh, you know, we have a strong presence in the apartment segment. Um, and even in the, uh, you know, self-construction, uh, you know, our, uh, we work through channel partners, etc. So connectors, etc. 
so uh, every day we come across customers who are uh, rate sensitive, who are more formal customers, who have uh, you know proper uh, um, you know documentation for income, etc. Um, and uh, we have to let go of such customers uh, because uh, they are rate sensitive. Uh, so the idea is to leverage our distribution and you know also onboard some of these customers under the co-lending program. Uh, so that way it improves our uh, improves the productivity of our own network uh, and our branches and uh, you know it, uh, allows us to leverage our infrastructure better. That's really the objective of the program. Uh, how much uh, to do is uh, is as a function of uh, how much we can do without disturbing the existing business. So we don't want to cannibalize the existing business. We don't want to uh, lose the focus on the existing business. Uh, so we will, we will tread very carefully in terms of you know how we uh, implement it on the ground. Um, and uh, you know maybe to begin with I can you know uh, since uh, you're asking for a number I would say maybe 10% uh, of our uh, business is something that we would uh, we would experiment we can we can experiment with um, and then we will see how it goes we are like I said we absolutely don't want to lose focus on our affordable housing uh, 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 which is our strength in the market. Oh, got it. So basically it would be for the same I mean uh, for the rate sensitive customers who are in the same ticket size. Uh, or will it be will it be focused towards a relatively high ticket size? Ticket size there could be a slight slight uptick in ticket size because the actually the customers who are rate sensitive uh, and which uh, whom we lose are the, who are also looking at a slightly higher ticket size. But within the priority segment because anyway this program is applicable only for priority sector. So the highest ticket size that we can offer under this program is only thirty five lakhs. Right, right, right. Got it. So one last question was that we brought down the liquidity on balance sheet to almost 11%. So will this be, is this the level that we would be maintaining as BAU level? That's right, yes. We'll maintain about one quarter of dispersal uh, approximately uh, as balance sheet liquidity. Got it, got it. Thank you so much and good luck for the next quarter. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Karthik Chalapa from Bona Vista Fund Management. Please go ahead. Yeah, great. Uh, thank you for the opportunity again. Just two quick uh, clarifications on this uh, co-originating model. So basically the arrangement is that 20% of the loan stays on the balance sheet and we also get a loan servicing fee. And if I contrast this, let's say, with our direct assignment where 10% of the loan actually stays on the book, Based on what limited business you have done with Union Bank till now, how does the yield on securitization compare with the min plus fee that you are earning on the co-lending model? Uh, so I think the difference will be uh, uh, difference will be uh, primarily the fee that we are earning, uh, Karthik, um, and uh, 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 and maybe a slightly better spread. So can we say that this co-lending model on an ultimate spread, including the fee, is actually better than securitization from a yield perspective? Uh, yeah, you're putting us in a spot, but yes, uh, yes, uh, mathematically, yes. Okay, mathematically, yes. Okay, this, this is useful. The second one is, if I were to look at the 6,000 odd cases which have been uh, directly assigned so far, uh, of which 10% we have retained on the balance sheet. The holding period after origination was about 20 months, and the remaining period is about 207 months, which adds up to about 227 months, or roughly 19 years is the total duration of the loan. This seems to be slightly on the higher side because I thought usually the loan tenure is something like 13 to 14 years with the actual uh, duration being somewhere between 6 to 7. This 18 to 19 looks to be on the higher side. Is that the case or is that pretty much the total duration for most of the loans? Uh, so Karthik, I will uh, get started on this. Uh, what we are looking is at the disclosures in the financials. Uh, so the holding period, the residual holding period is coming to 19 uh, years. It is, uh, uh, so our contracted uh, uh, tenure is 20 years or 25 years. So that's what you are seeing. On behavior, it will end up being seven years, which is what is uh, the uh, real performance uh, uh, and on the book. And the seven years is what you will use to compute your NPV for your securitization case, right? It will be the behavioral tenor, not this tenor. Okay. Okay. Behavioral tenor, seven years. Okay. Got it. This is very clear, Nusan. That's all from my side. Thank you. Thank you. 
The next question is from the line of Abhijit from Sundaram Mutual Fund. Please go ahead. Thanks for taking my question. Uh, congratulations on good setup, Sundar. I just have one question. What is the outstanding restructured book as on date? Outstanding. Sorry, outstanding. Uh, restructured book. Restructured book. Uh, re uh, restructured book is uh, the same, 30 or uh, 30 crores or so, which is about right now stands at about point uh, seven, uh, point seven six percent of the. Uh, Sure. Uh, and uh, is the momentum and distance expanding, sir? Uh, in Q4 and uh, what, what, if you can, without telling us exact numbers, what do you see on ground? On ground demand is very, very strong. Uh, actually, I, you know, between, you know, between the two waves, uh, I was, I managed to travel to uh, quite a number of places, um, you know, across the country, uh, you know, and also speak to customers, connectors, etc. Uh, demand is phenomenally strong in this segment. Uh, and uh, you know, it's a constraint is only how much you can you know, how much you can kind of take in and how much you can process of these loans. Uh, so very very strong demand, and uh, we are seeing that. Uh, so we are we are uh, kind of you know uh, implementing our distribution strategy. Uh, you know, we are focused on uh, uh, getting deeper into uh, you know the uh, uh, in, into the focus states uh, that we have and uh, build up the distribution. So um, very very strong demand on the ground. And this is without even uh, dilating any underwriting uh, requirements, sir, which you have. Absolutely, no. Yeah, without, uh, without dilating, without uh, I mean, without even look, without considering new segments. Right, right. Sure, sure. Thank you, sir. All the best for your uh, coming further. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Puja Uja from Monarch Network Capital. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, congratulations on the uh, great set of numbers this quarter. Uh, I just had one question. So, so this quarter we've seen, uh, you know, some level of branch expansion and employee addition. And we have guided a 3.2% or 3.2% OPEX to AUM. Uh, but our OPEX this quarter has largely been, uh, you know, under control. So, uh, do we expect, uh, are we still maintaining that 3% guidance for this financial year? Uh, or are we expecting, uh, and so then we are expecting a bulk of these costs to sort of come in the next quarter? Uh, so quarter four is what we're expecting, uh, 3%, and going forward as well. Yeah, so uh, I think the number of people addition, etc., was uh, still not uh, not very large this quarter. So as, the, as those numbers start increasing further, uh, you will see the impact on OPEX. Okay, sure, sir. So, yeah, that, that's it for mine. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Abhijit Tibdewal from Motila Loswal. Please go ahead. Yes, thanks for allowing me to follow up. Um, you know, I think, I mean, um, when I asked you and when I'm going through the notes to the financial statement, uh, it seems uh, 8 crores is the PNL impact of uh, the right offs, right? Uh, Abhijit, say again. It will be a Let me explain this uh, for uh, benefit of everyone. So the PNL is six crores. The write-off impact is two crores. Uh, for, for new growth, uh, which is essentially sitting in stage one, we have, uh, that is approximately two crores. Uh, the NPA Z classification, uh, which is moved into uh, GNP or stage three, the Z classification impact is one crore. And the balance one crore is some slippages uh, from uh, one bucket to the other. So that's the uh, total of six crores that you see on the PNL. Against this two crore of write-off, the loan uh, value of the write-off is uh, eight crores, and those are approximately 200 accounts where we have had to take a write-off. There are also some loan accounts where we closed which we did not need to take any write-off. So that's the full mathematics of this number. I just thought I'll spell it out once. Sure. Thank you so much. This is useful. Thank you. That's all for now. The next question is from the line of Rahul Maheshwari from Ambit Asset Management. Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Manoj uh, and uh, Nutan. Uh, uh, I had just two questions. In, in the uh, just recent remarks, you had said that for loan against property, the 40% of the uh, nature of the transaction is towards those who people take and repay to their own relatives. 
so the uh, loan against property the collateral is the same house property so what is the how the ltv moves because while giving the home loan to that same the ltv would be generally at a 50 55% and then uh, when the loan against property a small portion is given how the ltv moves for that same property or it's the different property you take as a collateral so it's the same property so customers uh, when they construct a house uh, typically they construct in uh, stages so when they start uh, many customers sometimes uh, uh, you know uh, uh, want to do it with their own funds so they start by doing with their own funds but they realize in between that they have to you know borrow and uh, you know many of them are not aware that you know housing loans are available etc so they uh, end up taking from friends relatives or even local money lenders and so on uh, and complete the house so after completing the house uh, you know they go through a phase where you know somebody wants the money back and so on so that's when they realize that yes i can take a loan against this house and uh, they they come to us uh, the ltvs uh, generally are uh, as per the loan against property product which is generally we do about 40% 40 to 50% max uh, so typically it stays in that range only so we don't do i mean even though it's a, the the actual uh, actual you can say product or actual requirement is to is to own that house we don't uh, take the ltv up uh, too much it's generally in the 50 50% range only so so manoj uh, the same customer who has taken the initial home loan uh, how many are the overlap taking the uh, lap also with you uh, or uh, they are completely so, no, these would be customers basically see we are, what we are talking about these are customers who would not have taken a home loan in the beginning they are basically trying to manage with their own funds and uh, or or borrowed from relatives etc and they don't have, there is no loan against that property okay 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 and, and uh, uh, that's very helpful and second thing uh, uh, can you give high, uh, some sense on the recent write off that had taken place no doubt you had again nutan has explained all financial details everything but uh, uh, going forward are you finding such a stress which you had witnessed in ncr where you had sold off the property how the ground level activity is taking place or is still you are finding such uh, instances can take place where few of the properties can be written off on a, uh, uh, until and unless the stress is and gets away so so this is more of a covid uh, you know covid impact or covid stress and as nutan mentioned we had already i mean since we have we have, uh, we have been last uh, four quarters you would have seen we have taken a lot of provisions Uh, even today our provision stands at 1.2% of the aum which is fairly high right uh, so as a result of that uh, um, uh, and this is just the process of now liquidating these properties right so um, so while we have liquidated a large number of properties there still you know and we have uh, you can say written off uh, a, la- a large number of uh, i mean or settled settled or sold a large number of properties the pnl impact only two crores as nutan mentioned so which which means we are obviously uh, we are carrying a lot of provision against those properties already so we are likely to see this for a couple of quarters as we dispose of more and more properties because we are still at the end of the day we are sitting on uh, 68 crores or rather uh, right now 100 crores of uh, npa so as we uh, try to bring this npa number down uh, we will have to basically sell these properties and there will be some loss that we will have to take in these properties because as you can see in the market there are a large number of entities which are also trying to sell properties uh, so there is uh, you know especially in npa properties there is uh, some loss that we will need to take so this is uh, that that is what this uh, where this is coming from so basically uh, uh, the lgd if it's 25% and you are taking a write off for those property uh, because of the covid impact that is taking place so on pnl impact uh, the 20 25% of the provision will definitely get built up so rest 75% is at least the recoverable value uh, M- am i going right uh, or well, you are absolutely right but in many cases the recoverable value will be even lower you know because especially because there's a dumping of properties in the market right so uh, you know uh, so because of that we will have to take some write off in all of these cases okay and in your loan mix uh, how much is uh, linked to floating of fixed uh, any such uh, nature can you uh, give highlight uh, but it's largely fl- floating only um uh, so um except for a small portion of uh, small portion of loans that are linked to an nhp scheme um where we are supposed to offer a fixed rate to the customer uh, rest is rest is all floating so 90% plus would be floating we also get yeah and in those loans or those fixed uh, those loans fixed rate loans we also get a fixed rate from nhp so in a, in effect it is uh, you know uh, back to back fixed and just last question manoj uh, 
on a strategic level uh, uh, as you have uh, you're going slow on the uh, state expansion whichever state you are going you are going more deeper into that but any going forward in next 2 3 years which are the new states which you would be planning out to expand your uh, branches uh, etc means how how the network expansion is in the radar for you so all of these uh, six states which i mentioned are uh, are uh, focus states for us as per as network expansion is concerned uh, gujarat maharashtra tamil nadu andhra telangana and karnataka uh, so we are at varying stages in varying uh, or varying levels of distribution or penetration in each of these states uh, so for example in gujarat we have very strong and deep uh, penetration uh, and uh, um, so we our attempt is to kind of you know take that or uh, Uh, take it to that level and all the other four, other five states as well. Um, so all these six states, uh, you know. So at the end of maybe two to three years, we want to kind of be at a you know, uh, fairly deep level of penetration uh, in all these six states. Sure, sure. Thank you very much and best wishes to the team. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Dhruvish from Mirabilis Investments. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, so I have three questions. So firstly, on the connector front. So if I look at the sourcing mix, so roughly 65%. Uh, if I include the micro connector, comes from connector. So like, uh, uh, how uh, what this number would be as of now? And like, uh, since it's like two third of the business coming from connector, so fundamentally, like, how do we see this? Are we comfortable with this? Because uh like uh, i'm trying to understand why would a fundamentally why would a connector prefer us over some competitor i mean what is the competitor raises the uh, payout to the uh, connector so why would he have a reason to stick with us so that's the first question so it's a uh, you know um you know if we want to get it get into a let's say a very deep level of uh, penetration uh, you know uh, in in the states where we are present we need a local connect with the connect with the customer because uh, uh, we are uh, talking about customers who are uh, um, you know uh, probably building or buying a house for first time in their lives and uh, uh, you need to reach to reach out to the customer at that you know you can say a specific moment when he is thinking about uh, purchasing the property or building the property which a local person will be able to do better right so if uh, uh, so in each of the markets you need somebody who is you know locally connected who is with uh, with the local uh, you can say uh, ecosystem and uh, who uh, knows immediately when a customer is looking to uh, you know purchase a property uh, so that is the connector network and uh, uh, just like any other dealer network or distribution network uh, you know we will have to uh, engage with them we will have to uh, you know uh, provide good service uh and uh, have a method of uh, you know kind of developing or nurturing that network which is what we are doing um it is not entirely uh, about entirely about payout because payouts are fairly uh, uh, fairly generic in nature uh, you know there is there is uh, there uh, there are no players who are offering substantially high payouts etc so there is generally uh, you know 20 to 40 basis points 50 basis points kind of a payout that is uh, norm that is there in the market and generally everybody practices the same Uh, so like i said it is any like any other distribution network where you have to nurture the network uh, using uh, both uh, qualitative and quantitative uh, methods uh, which is what we are doing and uh, uh, technology helps to some extent plus our uh, let's say focus on turnarounds etc helps to some extent uh, so we are able to engage these people on mobile apps uh, provide them you know various promotions on mobile apps etc so that is how we uh, nurture this network okay so like do we expect this number to remain stagnant or would it come down gradually uh, like this connector network uh, concentration no i think uh, in some form or the other the connector network will be there so which is why we have kind of also divided it into um, different categories so there is a builder ecosystem there is uh, financial connectors there is a construction community micro connector etc uh, so you know while if one goes up the other might come down kind of a scenario right so but ultimately there has to be a local connect or local person in the market in the ecosystem with whom you will need to have a tie up to understand who is who in that market is interested in taking a loan so um, uh that's uh, that's really how we are seeing it okay and my second question is with respect to the branch net uh, target for the next 3 years like if you did talk about doubling the sales force ground level sales force in 2 years but like uh, and fundamentally i'm trying to understand how do we expect the aum to double uh, from here like 
would it majorly come from the branch network because right now we are at some 66 uh, odd crores uh, that is a loan per branch so do we expect that to go up substantially or uh, the substantial increase in AUM would come from the increasing number of branches so some th your thoughts on that so uh, 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 so both will work uh, bo work uh, work uh, in uh, in uh, you know supporting each other uh, so our branch network also we are looking at increasing it from the current 76 to about 140 in the next uh, two years right uh, uh, so that number is also almost doubling um, plus the number of distribution points are also going up from about 180 to 360 we are uh, we are planning so both uh, new locations as well as the existing branches <coughs> sorry physical branches are going up uh, from the in the, from the existing branch network again we will get some throughput because uh, you know some of the digital branches uh, are serviced or uh, you know they are mapped to the uh, mapped to the large existing uh, existing branches so it will be uh, it will be both existing branches uh, have to grow to the next level and uh, there will be uh, um, you know currently about 25 percent of our business comes from new distribution expansion but then that is a rolling number uh, you know and. Um, uh, so we will be in the 25 to 40 percent ballpark number for new distribution expansion uh, or loans coming from new distribution expansion for the next couple of years uh, and the balance will be coming from our existing branches got it and okay so uh, my next question is on the you talk about the major majorly the rate is the floating so is, is it only linked to repo or like uh, and and when the repo gets repriced uh, in what time does the repricing happen to the customer? I mean the time frame. Sorry. It's actually largely linked to the MCLR of banks, uh, which are lending to us. That's uh, what it is linked to. So our uh, our internal uh, you know PLR or uh, uh, lending rate uh, uh, you know benchmark is linked to the uh, you know uh, our uh, borrowing rate, uh, which in turn is then linked to the customer rate. Um, so. Uh, if the MCLR changes, uh, you know, then our uh, you know internal uh, benchmark also will change. Um, when we pass on, uh, we normally have some threshold after which we pass it on. So if it is only five ten basis points, we normally uh, kind of absorb it uh, because the cost of passing it on, the logistics etc. will be challenging. Plus, it also makes it very unpredictable for customers. Um, but if the change is more, uh, you know, in the market, then we will, uh, uh, you know, we will be able to pass it on. So. Uh, uh, since it's all floating and you know we have done this in the past uh, you know it's uh, not a challenge we can pass it on to the customer okay okay uh, and my last question is on the ltv so like the ltv on live book on a blended basis is some 47 percent so theoretically speaking like on 100 crore exposure when we have just given a 47 crore loan then theoretically we don't expect a write-off so like the write-off which we uh, talked about earlier is just because of that covid impact or do we expect some municipal uh, write offs to continue going forward as well. So, minuscule write offs will be there uh, because of COVID impact. Um, you know, so uh, so out of the 100 crores, let us keep aside the 33 crores which are uh, you know there because of the classification, uh, because those are most those are higher, better quality customers. You know, who are paying some installments, etc. Uh, so let us uh, talk about the 68 crores which are more uh, chronic NPS. So out of, out of 68 crores, if let us say our attempt is to bring that down. Uh, you know, over the next one year, um, you know, so whatever whatever uh, properties we are disposing of, we are likely to take some. Uh, you know, the rest, there will be some impact of uh, 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 impact of selling those properties. So that is the right of that we will ex we can expect going forward. Okay, okay, and just one data keeping question. So the NCD which we recently issued to uh, from ICIC Prudential, the 99 crore. So wanted to understand the tenure and the rate of the same. Uh, so it's a two-year uh, NCD. It has a structure around the put option at the end of one year, uh, and the pricing is seven percent. Ten, ten years a day. Seven percent. Oh, okay, yeah, okay. That, thanks. That's it for my side. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Subrant Mishra from Systematics. Please go ahead. Hi, thank you for the opportunity again. Uh, just a few uh, follow-up questions on previous comments. Uh, you mentioned that uh, we'll have this, uh, we are inclined to have this lap uptick in tier two, tier three cities. Is this more to do with uh, a longer time frame for the home loans to break even? Also, how do we manage the liquidity, uh, liquidity risk of the uh, lap itself uh, as we go down in the tier of the cities? The liquidity of that property also uh, comes off. So uh, that's the first question. Second is on the insurance attachment. 
uh, we mentioned that uh, we have a hundred percent insurance attachment, which are the insurance companies uh, we work with, or we give the customer a, uh, a freedom of choice. And uh, uh, in term, uh, is insurance part of the same home loan, or is it a separate loan? Yeah, so you, uh, first question I think was related to liquidity of properties in smaller towns, right? I mean, across both home loans and LAP, or was it specifically okay. specific to LAP? Uh, why, uh, why are we more inclined to increase the proportion of LAP? Is it more to do with the break-even time of uh, HL? Uh, has the break-even time of the HL gone up? That, what is no, no, the no, I LAP, uh, See, what happens is because see, we are dealing with, uh, are dealing with external channels and... Uh, uh, you know, we have our own branch distribution also. Um, so generally in the market, people see LAP as a related product. And if a customer wants a LAP, he walks into a housing loan company. Similarly, our channels, the connectors uh, refer LAP cases also to us. Uh, so while we are not actively pursuing a LAP number, uh, you know, uh, 10%, 10 to 15% of uh, the loans that come through uh, come for loan against property. And, uh, you know, the, if we find that uh, the profile is good, if we find that the loan is, uh, uh, you know, doable loan, then we go ahead and approve it. So, which is the reason our lab number is uh, where it is. Uh, so, we are not really actually pursuing a target or a number uh, for lab. Um, and uh, as far as properties are concerned, uh, you know, smaller town versus larger uh, thing, there are, it has its own pros and cons. So, when we say smaller town, we are not really going very remote and, uh, you know, uh, where there is a very thin population or where there is a liquidity issue. I mean, these would be reasonably large towns, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, where there is a, um, a vibrant market for property. Uh, so, I mean, just to put things in perspective, you know, for example, we are currently present only in about 150 towns. Uh, whereas, you know, if you look at uh, in your Domino's or McDonald's, they are, they are present in 300 plus towns. Uh, so, I mean... The simple benchmark is that, uh, you know, any town that we go into, there will be a vibrant market for a, uh, for a house that we are financing. Um, so, uh, so that's on the liquidity side. As far as the insurance question is concerned, uh, we, we uh, work with Bharti Aksa uh, as the insurance carrier, and um, uh, uh, we have been uh, working with them for a while. And uh, it is, uh, you know, the, we finance the premium, and we book it as a separate loan. Uh, so it's not part of the housing uh, housing loan. It is a separate loan. We, uh, uh, I mean, that all that is all the clarity is given to the customer that there is a separate loan that is being booked to finance the premium of premium of the insurance. If we have done done it that way because some customers prefer to uh, sometimes um, um, uh, pay off the insurance loan, uh, you know, faster when they get some extra funds. Uh, so. Uh, we have kept it for convenience. Plus, also as per the income tax rules, uh, your housing loan benefit cannot be extended to the insurance loan. So, which is why we keep it as a separate loan. Right. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. As there are no further questions from the participants, I would now like to hand the conference over to the management for closing comments. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for uh, joining on the call. Uh, I hope you have been able to answer all your queries. In case you require any further details, you may get in touch with Manish Kayal, who has the investor relations function, or you can, uh, you can get in touch with Orient Capital, our external investor relations advisor.